We are life forms and we're surrounded and embedded in other life forms. And the most basic features of our life are probably the most basic features of life elsewhere in the universe. But what are those basic features? What are the most basic requirements for life? Well, the universe is filled with stars like our sun. And it's filled with rocky planets like the Earth. And it's filled with water like the Murrumbidgee River. And it's also filled with amino acids like in the proteins in my, in my finger and my hand and my head and my legs. So the universe is filled with all the ingredients to make life. The universe is a well-stocked kitchen. There are about three or four hundred billion stars in our galaxy. Here are some of them. Our star, the sun, is one of those stars. For example, let's suppose that it's right here. And we know that that star has a planet around it called the Earth on which life has evolved. What can life on that Earth tell us about ET? What can life on our planet tell us about the life that may have evolved on other planets around these hundreds of billions of other stars? So the name of this course is Are We Alone? Well, how did we get here? So by looking at how we got here, hopefully, by looking at the basics of that process, we can discover how life might have gotten on these other planets. So the study of how we got here can help us find life elsewhere because why? Why do we think that? Because the laws of physics, like these Maxwell equations, and the laws of chemistry, like here in this periodic table, are the same everywhere in the universe. Of, on all the hundreds of billions of wet, rocky planets, gravity is the same. This is Newton's law. And water behaves the same way. It'll, have a, it'll make a wave. And electrons and protons have the same mass and make the same elements. And they combine to form the same molecules with roughly the same relative abundances. All of these things are common ingredients that we can expect elsewhere. And that provides the basis for our belief that life will start from the same beginnings. So the intimate connections between physics, chemistry, and biology on Earth should be the same as they are elsewhere. In other words, no terrestrial magic seems to have been required to produce life. So here's a tree of all life on Earth, bacteria here and archaea here. And at the core, the, all of this life had a common origin somewhere here. We call it the root. And that's common. And that's the part that we think we want to find out about. Now, that evolved in many, many different ways over 4 billion years. There's all kinds of variety. And here in these blue regions, like there are elephants, and there's E. coli, and there's all kinds of things. I don't even know the names of all of these things. Um, but possibly, these things are rare. Here is common, and we're making a hypothesis that common th origins lead to, after four billion years of evolution, to weird, quirky, different outcomes. So another way to look at that is, here's the origin of life, and these other planets produce life, and they produce the diversity of life in the universe. Here's the Earth, and here's the diversity of life on Earth. It's a tiny fraction of the diversity of life in the universe, but they all came from the same origins. So the basic principle that I think we can rely on is the closer we get to the origin of life on Earth, that's closer to the universality of life in the universe. So we have the origins of life, and here's a common core. So here's the common core that's shared by all life in the universe. We have life on Earth evolving out of the core and then producing elephants and people and bacteria. Over here on planet X, we have also a common core where life started, and then all kinds of weird life forms that we know nothing about. And then on planet Y, the same deal. So if this is common, these are the quirky, weird, potential, probably unique outcomes of three or four or five billion years of evolution 
on these other planets. So we can find out about the common core by constructing the tree of life that's here and uh, following this tree of life back to Luca and beyond. So there's Luca and here's beyond to the origin. And we're trying desperately to figure out what are the features here that can get us back to here that can get us back to there. Maybe getting back to there, they're bacteria-like organisms or maybe even a viral world. So looking at that common core again, physics and chemistry, then proto-biochemistry, molecular evolution, biochemistry. And so life on Earth evolved from physics and chemistry. Life on planet X did the same. Life on planet Y did the same. And the question is, what's the time scale in this diagram? How far back in time does biology go before it becomes physics and chemistry? What's the time scale? Now this diagram assumes a common core of physics and chemistry that is associated with the origin of life on the Earth and on other planets. But there's another model that's contradict that's contradicts, it's, it's, it's different from the one I just showed, and that is maybe there are separate origins of life. And so here's Earth life evolves over here, maybe the yellow planet X over there, and maybe planet green Y over here, and they just evolve in different places and evolve in different directions. There's no common core. But you could also consider a modification of that model in which, hey, you have Earth life here, starts here over here, it evolves this direction, yellow life evolves this way, green life evolves that way, and convert, no common core, but convergent selection pressure produces similar outcomes. That's right here is the similar outcome, even though they started in different places. Now you can make a hybrid model in which you kind of have separate origins, but they're really close to uh, being the same and then they evolve their separate ways. So there's a common core of physics and chemistry, but with deep independent biology that doesn't extend all the way into physics and chemistry. Now, what are the most basic features of life on Earth? Because those are the ones we're going to use to extend and understand what Luca was doing. Well, here's a list that we published in 2012. Liquid water as a solvent, carbon as a scaffold, Elemental abundances of H, O, C, N, S, P. These are the six most abundant elements in life. And then there's the Lego principle, where you make polymers out of monomers. Then there's homochorality, and we'll talk about each one of these. Uh, free energy from thermodynamic equilibrium. All life needs some type of energy. And Darwinian evolution of inheritable molecules. So let's talk about these. Now, there are seven of them. That's kind of an arbitrary number, but let's go with it. So one, water. Maybe in solids, molecules lack mobility. So maybe you can't have life evolving in solids. In gases, maybe the molecules lack structure, and so you can't form life. So we think, many of us think, that liquid is needed for biochemistry. And water is the most abundant liquid on the surface of rocky planets all over the universe. Number two, carbon, the scaffold of biochemistry. So here we have an amino acid. And it's carbon, carbon, there's carbon everywhere here, and it's the backbone. Things like the oxygen and the H's and the N's are hanging off of the carbon. Here's a lipid. Every time you see one of these in an organic molecule, these are, these are carbon, 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 carbon. This is a lipid. It has a head and a tail, and there's so many carbons everywhere. And then there's also carbohydrates. Again, whenever you have these lines that go crooked, there's a C and a C and a C. And a C. <laughs> They're everywhere. Carbo, that's why carb, carbohydrates. <clears throat> Now, here's carbon in the periodic table. And sometimes people say, what about silicon? Silicon is right underneath carbon in the periodic table. It has some similar characteristics. Why not silicon? Why isn't life based on silicon? Well, here is a plot of the elemental abundances in the sun. And they are a good representative of elemental abundances in the universe. So we're having a, showing a plot here of a good representative of the relative abundances of all the elements compared to each other. Now this is a logarithmic plot, and so the abundances of silicon here is 6. So factors of 10, factors of 10, factors of 10, silicon comes in at 10 to the 6. And right, there's carbon, and there's silicon. And the difference is 10. Carbon is 10 times more abundant than silicon. So if the probability of life forming on carbon and silicon is the same, there should be about 10 times as many life forms based on carbon uh, than there are in, on, based on silicon. Now, number three, 
these Hawk and Spe, those hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, where are they? Well, these are elements of life are among the most abundant elements in the universe. So where's hydrogen? Hydrogen is here, the most abundant element. And then let's get rid of the noble gases because they don't make any molecules and so they're not interesting. They can't form life. So what is left? Well, here is the O, C, and N of O, C, N right here. And you can see how abundant they are compared to these other elements. Remember, this is a factor of 10, 10, 10, a factor of 1,000. And then there's S and P. Here's S and here's P. Now P is a little bit lower and you might say, why did nature choose phosphates? And if you're interested in that question, have a look at Westheimer's 1987 paper. So H and O are the most abundant elements that form molecules. So no wonder H2O is so common. No wonder there's water on lots and lots and lots of other planets, we think. Now, what about these elements? These elements are the building blocks of life. They are falling from the sky, literally, on the early Earth and even today to some extent. This is a carbonaceous chondrite, and inside of it are all these elements. And uh, we think that all these elements also d have fallen on the early surfaces of rocky planets all over the universe. So there's nothing special about these things that only landed on Earth. We think they, have, they landed on other rocky planets well, as they were forming as well. What about the Lego principle? Number four, polymers from monomers. <clears throat> what are those polymers? Well, proteins are a polymer, lipids are a polymer, DNA and RNA are polymers, and polysaccharides are a polymer. So polymers are everywhere. I am made out of polymers here. So here's a protein. <clears throat> it has an amino acid. <clears throat> These are all amino acids. It's like a little train here. So if you have a cellular structure like a filament, if you look at it more carefully, you see it's made out of a polymer. And these are individual amino acids. And they, here's a representative monomer am amino acid. So how about DNA and RNA? Here's RNA and DNA. They have nucleotides. They don't have amino acids. They have nucleotides. Same here with DNA. So a cellular structure would be a chromosome. We look very carefully. We see the DNA strand. And then we see a nucleotide made out of a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Now what about uh, phospholipids? These are lipids. So here we have a head and a tail, a fatty acid tail, and a head group here. And we look at what structure, cellular structure. Oh, this is something like uh, uh, adipose cell walls. And then here's, the, here's a polymer a triglyceride, and then here's a fatty acid that goes into making these. And then lastly, polysaccharides. Here's a monosaccharide. What's cellular structure? Well, inside of a chloroplast, you have a starch grain. Here's what that starch looks like, and the monomers here are monosaccharides. So the principle is the same. You get polymers from monomers. Now let's have a look at the little bit more detail, phospholipid detail that, that helps us understand the earliest divergence in life. So let's talk about cell membranes. Now bacteria have cell membranes that can be simplified and look like this. And what happens is head group and the tail group, the head group is here, the tail is here, the tail is here, the head group there. And so that's a, bi a bilipid membrane. And how about in archaea? They have something very similar uh, and they do this. This is the membrane in archaea. And over here, you have unbranched fatty acid chains. That's what this is. Over here, you have a branched isoprene chain. That's these little dots, these little lines coming off. Over here, you have what's called an ester bond. And over here, you have an ether bond. Slightly different, but very fundamental differences. And then you have D-glycerol. And over here, you have L-glycerol. So they have different handedness, this glycerol, in so the fundamental uh, molecule that goes into making the uh, membranes. And then you have, so we have a chiral difference, left, right-handed and left-handed. So homochirality is also something we'll talk about. But in general, you should know that the uh, amino acids in life on Earth are left-handed and the sugars are right-handed. And here's how you can think of an amino acid being left-handed and right-handed. That's called homochirality. And uh, maybe life on other planets are also homochiral. What about energy? Well, when you think about energy, you can think about gravitational energy here or nuclear energy, like what the sun is doing. But as a life form, we get our energy from chemical redox potential. Essentially, we're talking about electrons falling closer to a proton or a proton 
folding across a membrane potential. Also, you get light, you get energy from the sun because of this temperature difference of about 6,000 degrees here and about 255 Kelvin here. And so that's an entropy difference that we can take advantage of. Darwinian evolution of inheritable molecules. That's another ingredient that's very fundamental to life. And here's the DNA, there's a nucleotide we showed before. And here's a plot of, here's time going this way. And here we have a zygote. And a zygote gets older and older and then has sex and then passes on its DNA, then turns into an adult and dies. The same thing happens to the child, has sex, turns into another, makes a baby and then dies. So all these adults die. All the DNA goes back and back and back around, and this is immortal. So DNA is immortal, and that's what's inherited, not these soma, these somatic bodies of the adults. So water like this is probably common in the universe. And so is carbon and the other elements that we need to make a body. And so is starlight from a star. So there doesn't seem to be anything special about the Earth that would uniquely qualify it as the only abode for life in the universe. Ah!